Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome Joyce Carol Oates in support of the 20th anniversary edition of Blonde and her latest novel, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars. Tonight, she'll be joined in conversation by Literati bookseller and author of Number One Chinese Restaurant, my friend Lillian Lee. Um, just a reminder of some Zoom etiquette. Uh, if you um, have heard me as you came in, I'm probably just repeating myself, but you are muted, you'll stay muted. Uh, we just ask that you keep your video off. If it, somehow you inadvertently turn your video on, we can disable it. But if it comes on again, we may have to remove you from the meeting. It's the one security item we tend to. Um, we will also have time following the event, uh, the conversation between Lily and, and Joyce for a Q&A. And you can ask questions in the chat. They go directly to me. So no one else will see them. Um, they'll be sent directly to me. You can ask questions in the chat directly to me at any time. I'll collect them and ask them to Joyce at the end. And a reminder, you can purchase Joyce's books at the event page, and I will post links in the chat as well. Uh, you can buy all sorts of books from our website, and select titles are now available for curbside pickup if you live in the Ann Arbor area, or if you live a little further than the Ann Arbor area and uh, want to drive, uh, you can do curbside too. Um, in lieu of a book purchase, we also ask that you consider a um, $5 donation uh, to sustain our ongoing event programming, which will be virtual for the foreseeable future. Um, we're really lucky to be able to continue to bring events to our community during this time. And um, so we just, if you want to think of that as a, a one-time event fee or a, a weekly subscription or a monthly subscription or a subscription for the year, um, we appreciate it. Otherwise, we just simply thank you for joining, for attending uh, the event this evening. Um, so without further ado, Joyce Carol Oates is the re recipient of the National Medal of Humanities, the National Book Critics Circle Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Book Award, and the Penn Malamud uh, Award for Excellent in short, Excellence in Short Fiction, and has several times been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. She has written some of the most enduring fiction of our time, including the national bestsellers, We Were Mulvaney's Blonde, which was nominated for the National Book Award, and the New York Times bestseller, The Falls, which won the 2005 Prix Femina. Her most recent novel is A Book of American Martyrs, and she is the Roger S. Berlin Distinguished Professor of the Humanities at Princeton University, and has been a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters since 1978. And Lillian Lee received her BA from Princeton and her MFA from the University of Michigan. She is a recipient of a Hopwood Award in short fiction, as well as Glimmer Train's New Writer Award. Uh, she is from the DC metro area and lives down the road from me in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, Number One Chinese Restaurant is her debut novel. Please join me in using your uh, clap reaction functions at the bottom of your screen to welcome Joyce Carol Oates to your living rooms. All right. So hello, Joyce. Thank you so much for joining us today in the virtual literati uh, event space. Uh, when I was first told that I had the task of covering uh, not just your, your latest book, um, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars, but also uh, Blonde as well in celebration of the 20th, uh, 20 year anniversary. Um, I have to admit to feeling a little bit out of my depth since, as you can see, it, it ends up, you know, stacking up to you know, over a thousand pages <laughs> of Joyce. Um, but in fact, I'm really grateful uh, that it was the nature of this event that I got to read those two books back to back. Um, I certainly don't tend to read that way in my natural reading habit. I like to jump around, not a completionist, but when I read your books back to back, you know, essentially immersing myself in two weeks in your work, I was able to see how your books talk to each other, but also kind of talk over each other. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of leads me into my first question, which is, you know, you have uh, the books that you've written, the short stories, memoirs, criticism, you know, over the years. With this new book out now, was there ever a sense of continuing a conversation that you started many books ago? Or was this new book always a, uh, its own creature from the start? Well, that's a very interesting question, Lillian. I think it's difficult to answer because, and you probably would agree with this 
when you're working on a project, you're so totally immersed and, and kind of obsessed with it. You're not actually thinking about the penumbra of your life. You know, you're not, you're not consciously thinking of something that you may have done 20 years ago. But both these novels that you have read back to back, and this is embarrassing to, to admit, both the novels turn out to be much longer than I had anticipated. <laughs> Especially Blonde, I had anticipated that would be about maybe 200 pages long. I wanted to write a very slender postmodernist oh, wow. of ironic novel. It was going to be about Norma Jean Baker, who was this girl, kind of an American girl, a typical American girl, uh, very pretty, but not beautiful and not, not blonde. And it was going to end with her be being a starlet at a very big uh, Hollywood production company. And she was given the name Marilyn Monroe. That was going to be the end of my novel. <laughs> and I was thinking that then the reader would supply what comes next, and it was very ironic. She perceives being gifted with this name, Marilyn Monroe, as, as a blessing, mm. but we would perceive it as maybe a curse. But then when I got to that part in the novel, when I was writing it, I realized that the great effort lay ahead. So I had, I actually wrote 1,200 more pages. <laughs> and for, as a writing teacher, it's almost embarrassing because I, I shouldn't really admit, you know, that it's like getting on a wild horse and somehow you end up far, farther away than you had anticipated. That's absolutely true. Um, and then when it came to Night, Sleep, Death and the Stars, how did that this, um, book kind of, you know, run off on its own and carry you with it? Well, this also is very big, but I think it's not as long as Blonde. Well, what happened with this novel is I sort of fell in love with a family, uh, a, a married couple, and they have five children. And somehow each of the children became very important to me. And as I kept working on the novel, I didn't really want to summarize or, or skip over important parts of their their lives mm -hmm. so it ended up being in a sense like five novels i suppose <laughs> because each of them is working out patterns of grief there's the widow who enters into a phase of her life she would never and never guessed at. uh the, the experience of grief is a little bit well i used the analog a minute ago of a wild horse so you've sort of got it on the back of some wild creature and if you don't get thrown off and don't get killed it takes you to some place you can't anticipate so the experience of grief is like that and then writing the novel became in a way like that also but i love family novels i love to read family novels and and you wrote a family novel also. that's right i'm very drawn to family novels and so as soon as i saw the concept of, of your latest book, I was like, yes, right up my alley. Um, and, and I'm glad that you also brought up um, the, the, the intimacy of, with grief that um, the, this most recent book uh, engages with. Um, I ha you know, just to, to make some more comparisons to past work of yours, I know that Night, Sleep, Death, and the Stars and We Will the Mulvaney's uh, are, you know, kind of sometimes talked together uh, but because both books do feature this powerful and, and, and more importantly, popular family dissolving after a tragedy, though the tragedies differ. Um, but in fact, I separate those two books pretty clearly in my head because of that intimacy with grief. Well, and what I mean by that is, at least in my perspective, it felt that in We Were the Mulvaney's, as the reader, I felt like I was watching the Mulvaney's grieve in their separate patterns. But with Night, Sleep, Death, and the Stars, I felt like I was almost in that grief. Right? I was in that disorienting, mind-melting thick of it, and as close to grief as I could get without physically feeling it myself. And I was just so uh, compelled to ask you, you know, about that experience of writing a character who is so enveloped by grief, um, as opposed to maybe a, a more distant telling. Well, the emotions are pretty autobiographical, so mm. I don't want to go into it too much. I'm actually living in the house that's in the novel. It's not, 
my my real house here that I'm, that I'm in outside Princeton is not a landmark or historical house. It's in Night Sleep, Death and the Stars, they're living in a historic house, but it's the same house um, in every in many other ways in the same sort of geographical situation yeah. with the creek and the lake down there and certain just certain features. So it's very close to my own experience emotionally. Yeah. And some of the plot, I, I mean, you probably will not believe this, but you remember Max the Knife, the cat? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, this is so hard to believe, but I created this cat. I really like the cat a lot, a very uh, tough, feral tom cat called Mac the Knife in the novel. He comes out of the woods. I'm sort of looking at the woods out this window. <laughs> he comes out of the woods to the back door of Jocelyn's house, and she lets him in. And it seems to be like almost like a talisman of letting in something unexpected. Hmm. So f after I finished the novel, about four months after I created the fictitious Mac, a black tomcat came out of the woods. <laughs> and he, he, he was so smart he could go through the cat door, because we have, I have a cat door. He got in the house and he was kind of wandering around and I looked at this feral black cat and I thought, is this something from my novel? But he wasn't as mean or nasty as Mac the Knight. He was much more of a, a friendly kitty. <laughs> and he stayed for two or three years. Oh, wow. And then he went away again, the way feral cats do. Right. But that seems so extraordinary that I would create a fictitious cat, a black feral tomcat, and, and then the real, a, a real one would come out of the woods. Yeah, it's, it sounds like something that you would write in one of your novels, in fact. It's, it's also that we think it would be the reverse. At first, the cat came out of the woods, and then I put it in the novel, mm -hmm. but it wasn't that way. No, no, I mean, that, that's just quite eerie, but um, mm -hmm. in some ways, I feel like your grasp of the eerie probably made you the perfect recipient to this kind of uh, harbinger, whatever it is, whether it's good or bad. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up uh, Mac the Knife um, because he was one of my absolute favorite characters. Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> so virile and ferocious. I think at one point his uh, testicles are described and it was, um, <laughs> it felt very suitable uh, to notice that in a, in a cat so virile. Um, and, you know, kind of speaking to that virility, speaking to that robustness that uh, that male cat has that that same kind of vigor um, and vitality is often imbued in your male characters with Tom, uh, who is the eldest boy of the McLaren family, and Whitey, of course, the the patriarch who passes away. Um, and in kind of the flip side, um, in the shadow of that vitality, um, there are the women uh, of the family, and in some ways within Blonde, Norma Jean as well, um, and and their fragility, and in some ways you know, physical weakness is often keyed up in uh, relation to the, the vigor of the male. Um, and I wondered, you know, what it is that draws you to the portrayal of maybe uh, physical fragility, you know, whether that be embedded in the female or, or just in general physical uh, weakness surrounded by physical strength. Well, Jessalyn in the novel has been conditioned to be a very feminine woman. And she's, she's a very lovely, very sweet, good-hearted person who's hard, difficult to write about in fiction. I have like two or three good, really good characters in all, all of my writing because it's such a challenge to make them believable or even interesting. But there's a certain naivete and trust that characters like that have. They're, they tend not to be skeptical or ironic. However, when Jessalyn becomes a widow, and she later on has a friend, um, she falls in love by degrees with somebody else. He perceives that her femininity is really not to her advantage. Mm -hmm. So he makes her go hiking, and they go canoeing, and they do things that, that build her up physically. And I can say that's based on my own experience with my second husband hmm. who perceived that I could do many more things than I thought I could do and sort of, I wouldn't say he coerced me, but 
He certainly inveigled <laughs> me to go to the Galapagos. The novel ends with her in the Galapagos. I did a lot of things like traveling to Bali and going to Dubrovnik and Corsica. I did so many things in my second marriage mm. that I would never in a million, literally in a million years have thought I would do. So I wanted to talk, I wanted to present to the reader in a, in a very, uh, I think, kind of nuanced way, how a person who thinks mm. she's one kind of person, the widow, she actually has a good deal of a personality that's never been tapped. Right. It's kind of a dormant. So it becomes a matter, I think, of whom we meet in our lives. Of course, we have to be receptive to them. Mm -hmm. Some people just run away from a person who expects too much of them. Mm. And so I think women have a choice of falling into the role of being very feminine and or trying to get out of that role and maybe taking a risk of offending some people is just when offends their own children. They say, well, mom, you don't, that's not you. That's not, that's not normal for you. Mm -hmm. You sort of have to upset people around you who are adjusted to you being in a certain role. And then particularly when an older woman, like a mother, decides she doesn't want to be in that role anymore, she will find resistance in her own family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all really crisply portrayed um, in the ways that the five McLaren children um, mm -hmm. react to, to the way that Jesslyn changes. Um, and in the way that they react, it, you know, something that just to kind of go back a little bit back to the, the, the family structure of the five children, I was so drawn, I'm always drawn towards uh, large family uh, narratives, maybe because I only have a younger brother. And so at any point, our relationship is either we're getting along or we're fighting. <laughs> Just two combinations possible. But as soon as you get to families of four or larger with McLaren's five, there's an exponential number of combinations that are constantly shifting allies yeah. uh, and rivalries. Mm -hmm. But something that seemed especially interesting and a little bit more, a little bit less fluid uh, within that family structure of the McLarens is there's this kind of organic split between the elder McLarens, Tom, Beverly, uh, and Lorene, um, and then the younger McLarens, oh, Virgil and yeah. Sophia. And there's a, you know, maybe a gap of a couple of years between those two, two factions. Yeah. But that's how they think of themselves um, as, you know, the elders or the youngers. And there's a lack of intimacy between the factions. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, wondered if with that kind of birth order, having it so impact your character's personality, so impact the way they move through the world and therefore your, the shape of your novel as it is, did you always come into this novel knowing that was the family structure, that was the birth order? that you wanted, or um, was that something that you kind of discovered along the way? No, I, 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 I intended that. Yeah, and also in a, in a large family, and I hope I'm not just making this up, uh, sometimes or even very often, the last one, the last born is an accident. <laughs> <laughs> the parents, you know, they're getting to be in their 40s and they didn't really exactly want another baby, but somehow it happened. So there's a baby in the family, and they think of this as very family. I mean, they, they, love, they love the child. Like the little caboose at the end of the train, you know. And that young child will be almost like a different generation mm -hmm. from, the, from the oldest child. Yes. Yeah, I have... One of my favorite characters in the novel is this impossible, really horrible, obnoxious, over-the-top high school principal, Loren, who does all the awful things that you just never ever think she does them secretly mm -hmm. a very embittered angry person who gotten into a position of power as a high school principal and she can just do so many awful things to people behind their backs and she almost reminds me of our present well i don't want to get into politics but <laughs> the idea that you punish people who are not 100 percent for you, you know, mm -hmm. you have adversaries and supporters. It's a very unpleasant way to divide the world. Mm -hmm. And when I was working, when I was Im immersed in her, I thought, well, of course, there are obviously so many people like her in positions of power. We don't always know it. We don't always know the things they're doing surreptitiously. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad that you brought up Loren because um, I, well, I loved her as a character and I was not expecting to. She's described, I think, by her own father in a dream, granted, with, as having a murderous heart. And I think <laughs> that is a perfect description of uh, who she is and what you said earlier about her dividing the world into either those against her or for her. There is no middle line. It was, it was very stark. Um, and, and as she kind of loses her own grip on her power, you, you just see how that destruction is ultimately internal and it's eating her up inside. Um, and what was also so compelling to me is I find that you're especially good at maneuvering the reader to those darker human emotions that are all inside of us. Some of us uh, more comfortable confronting those, others less so. Um, you know, for example, with, with Blonde, um, I started off being so heartbroken for Norma Jean. You know, I just wanted to save her. I just wanted her to be okay. And by the end of the book, I found that I was almost as villainous as, you know, the worst characters. I kind of wanted her destroyed. I wanted her punished for, for whatever reason, if only it was the loss of her own innocence, which of course had to be lost with all the abuse that she suffered. And on the flip side, when I was reading about Loren essentially doing these awful, crossing such awful boundaries with her students, I could not help but sympathize. You know, almost, you know, in the way when you see a kind of like a, a really invigorated general charging into a, a, a corrupt <laughs> war, you just you still get kind of swept away by the power of that general. Um, you know, that technique of making the reader complicit, right, in our own cruelty, to confront the capacity <laughs> of our own meanness. I mean, how do you do it? How do you, how do you make that a comfortable, you know, uh, situation for your reader or not? Well, I didn't feel that, I didn't have that feeling about Norma Jean Baker. I felt that she was pretty much a victim and she was struggling to live. You know, she's this desperation through Marilyn Monroe's entire life. But Lorraine does come through and she's sort of broken. It's like she has to be broken, almost like literally her back broken. And then she sort of picks herself up and she realizes how awful she's become. But I think what happens with some people, and they can be adults, not necessarily children, when a strong parent dies, mm. uh, people just go into free fall. Mm. They don't realize how much they have been living to uphold some expectations of a parent and everything was in reference to the parent approving and then suddenly the parent's gone and suddenly a lot of the things that they're doing have no meaning because mm -hmm. they were doing it for for the father mm -hmm. or perhaps the mother in this case the mother is very loving and she loves all her children without any qualification it doesn't really matter what they do she will just love them Mm -hmm. So I was sympathetic with both characters, but I meant Lorraine to be so over the top that she's really funny. Mm -hmm. and she's very, so everything she does, she just is very self-justified. You know, everything she does, she feels she's a victim and other people deserve to be punished. Now I wrote this novel. Um, this is not the novel that I wrote most recently. Mm. My most recent novel that came out, My Life as a Rat, was written um, before this novel. Mm -hmm. And this novel, Night Sleep, was, it's out of order of the writing. The publication dates are out of order. So this novel was written a few years ago, My Life as a Rat, more recently. Mm, okay. So it's sort, of, it's sort of complicated why this happens in a publishing uh, schedule there's something about the, the intuitive feeling of what should come next. Mm. So I felt that my life as a rat should come next rather than this novel. Mm. Because A Book of American Martyrs was a long family novel. And a, my life as a rat is a much shorter novel. Mm. And its focus is a little, it's a little narrow. Mm. What is uh, my life as a rat um, focused on? Well, it is in a way, a fa it is a family novel, but it's much, it's, the focus is much different. Mm. And it's not so different in some ways in its uh, political, cultural concerns. It's about a hate crime perpetrated mm -hmm. on a young black high school student or mm -hmm. a young boy. And the hate crime is perpetrated by 
a number of, of I think it's four boys at high school and the sister of two of these boys sort of inadvertently tells on them mm -hmm. and then she's expelled from the family. So it's obviously a theme that haunts me to be mm -hmm. expelled from a family. Right. I don't know why I'm so haunted by it. I didn't have that experience in my own family. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in a fairy tale mode of King Lear where King Lear banishes Cordelia, the one daughter who really loves him, the good daughter, mm -hmm. banishes her. And there's something about that fairy tale situation that, that tugs at my heart. Hmm. Is it that quality of um, the wrong one punished, that kind of implicit unfairness that really tears at you in a way that I think it goes almost back to childhood, right? Yeah. When, when children are so sensitive to any levels of Unfairness that, you know, one extra chocolate chip and a brother's cookie will create an entire, you know, tantrum yes. for a day. Yes. Then some people are too young to know this, and you're probably one of them. But when a parent gets older, some, not everybody, but some people, when they get older and become elderly, their personalities may start to change. Mm -hmm. King Lear, obviously, is a, the best classical example of a brilliant work of art that deals with something like senility. Mm. Um, obviously, King, obviously, Lear is very eloquent, mm -hmm. but it's something like senility where his judgment is impaired. Right. And Goneril and Reagan talk about this to say, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not the man that he was. He's making mistakes. He's not thinking clearly. Mm. So if you, if you live long enough and if your parents live long enough, you may experience that alteration in their personality. Mm -hmm. They are not able to love you the way you were used to. Mm -hmm. And that is so stunning. I think people have not written much about that. It's so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we each experience it individually and don't think that it's a common experience. Right. Right. Absolutely. And it often can be couched in, you know, a declining health, um, or declining mental faculties, and it can be that blame can be placed on something exterior to to the person rather than an internal change. Um, and I think that is what is so um, so well captured with Jessalyn and um, and her uh, her children's um, pushback and, and their wish to have that adoring mother, that perfect mother, even as it seems you know it is that very niceness and that perfection that allows her to be the butt of so many of their jokes. Yes. Um, and they always think, oh, but we, you know, we were laughing gently, you know, it's because yeah. we loved her so much. And, and of course, that, that is not the, uh, the feeling of the person who is being laughed at. Um, yeah, they laugh at their mother because she doesn't know how to activate her credit card. <laughs> her husband always did it for her and then gave it to her. But then later on, when she has a, new, a man friend and wants to, you know, go out with him, then they don't want her to do that. You know, like they're <laughs> laughing at her for being so feminine and, and dependent. But then when, when she gets more independent, they don't like that either. No, no, they don't. <laughs> um, uh, that's, you know, that's something um, that is very interesting about how, um, you know, Jessalyn is also, you know, in some ways pushing back against her own transformation, right? She's also uncomfortable with the changes that she's going through. And it puts her in this kind of mindset of pretty consistent contradictions, right? Um, I love this, you know, new man that I've met. Oh, I don't, I will never love him. Oh, I'm not in love with him. Oh, I'm so in love with him. It, it's, it's so fascinating, right? That kind of the stream of consciousness uh, way that you write Jessalyn's um, multitudes of contradictions. And it felt so true to just how um, everyday life, you know, if you were to take a cross section of my day to day, you would find me wanting to eat a snack. No, I'm not hungry. Well, maybe I could eat something. Well, but my blood sugar, you know, just like back and forth, back and forth. And I would probably remember that as, oh, well, I decided I wanted a snack. So I got a snack. <laughs> I would erase all those contradictions. Um, exactly. I, yeah. So yeah. how, you know, how are you able to kind of uh, walk that tension, right, of, of the fact that as human beings, we're constantly contradicting ourselves, but we are selectively remembering our lives as an unbroken narrative? Well, I tend to remember the oscillations back and forth myself. <laughs> uh, in one day, I probably have about 500 different moods, sort of <laughs> mini moods. And I've learned just to somehow, like a downhill skier, 
just keep going and hope you don't fall, you know, and break your neck. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I relate to that very much. I'm glad to meet another person who, <laughs> who, uh, who changes as quickly as, as certain weather does, um, especially in, in Ann Arbor. Um, and, and, and to backtrack a little bit, you know, uh, back to Jessalyn's um, relationship with her children, the way that they kind of um, love and adore her, even as they also want to put her in a, a safe box. Um, there also is this, they're drawn in, also, in a way to their mother's beauty, right? And it's not just a child's love of a mother and, and finding every mother uh, beautiful. It, it's the outside world also judges Jessalyn to be a very beautiful woman. Um, and, you know, clearly in Blonde as well with Norma Jean, um, you know, she doesn't necessarily start off as, as gorgeous and beautiful, but there is that element of, of beauty within her, of attractiveness. Um, and, you know, was also noticing that, you know, the, ma the male characters are also sometimes described in um, terms of beauty or, or certainly handsomeness, attractiveness. Um, is there something that draws you towards, uh, towards writing about characters who are imbued with beauty, who, who, have, who have that as part of the shield through which they move through the world? Well, in the case of, of Marilyn Monroe, I was really drawn to writing about Norma Jean Baker. I saw a picture of her when she was about 15 or 16 years old. A high, I think it was a high school picture. I was so fascinated by the fact that she was, well, she was a brunette. She was a pretty girl, but she was not beautiful. Mm. She was not glamorous, and, and you would not have been able to foresee mm. how she was going to look in, in 10 years. So it was, what drew me to write about Norma Jean Baker is that she becomes Marilyn Monroe, mm. but she's sort of like the beggar maid who's made over into the princess, but then, the sta but then the, to be the princess is so hard for her. One of the epi epigraphs to Blonde is a quote from Sartre that I think is very beautiful. Sartre says, genius is not a gift, but the way we invent in desperate circumstances. Yes. So Norma Jean's inventing herself constantly not to drown, not to die. She's a marginal person in society. Her father never acknowledged her. Her mother's schizophrenic. She's sometimes in foster homes or sometimes in an orphanage, but she can't be adopted because she has a mother. So she's always sort of inventing herself and she becomes this infant, this very beautiful, but sort of sexually infantilized um, Marilyn Monroe, mm. who is not any threat to a man. Mm. She's very beautiful, but very kittenish mm -hmm. and, and childlike and literally breathless. She's got this whole manner. Norma Jean learned how to play Marilyn Monroe, but that was not her. The charisma of Marilyn Monroe is all fictitious. The blonde hair, the beauty mole, the makeup, all these things are sort of all put together. The real Norma Jean or the real Marilyn Monroe after a while, uh, if you see the way she looked when she was at the, the uh, actor's studio, she was an attractive woman, but she wasn't that glamorous person. Right. She would walk around New York City with a man's hat on or just ordinary jacket. People wouldn't ne necessarily recognize her. Then Jessalyn, in, in the other novel, she is a conventionally beautiful woman. She's not glamorous or idiosyncratic. She's a quietly loving, tender, maternal, really wonderful person, a lovely person, probably based on people whom I've met, who, as I said, it's very hard to write about people like this. We all know them. Mm. Sometimes they're very uh, generous and trusting, but sometimes they are taken for granted. I mean, usually they're taken for granted by their, by their children. You know? <laughs> so when she gets, she sort of throws herself out of that role. She's no longer dressing the way she did. She threw out some of her high-heeled shoes. She, get, she tries to even give away her mink coat. So I'm not gonna wear these things anymore because my husband's dead and she, doesn't, she didn't, didn't really want a mink coat. It was something mm -hmm. he gave her. Of course, she, of course you wear the mink coat if your husband gives it to you, if you love your husband. So, you know, sort of unwittingly she's in that role. And one of the most revealing parts of the novel, and if there are any wives in this, um, 
in this chat room, you'll maybe agree with this. When she goes for a mammogram and is sort of a, a positive, it looks like she has to go back, she keeps that secret from her husband. She would never tell her husband that there is some possibility she has breast cancer. She tells her daughter, or she might tell another woman. She shields her husband because of, if she knows if she tells him that he'll fall apart. Mm -hmm. In other words, even if you yourself have cancer, you're still thinking of this, <laughs> this strong husband who has to be propped up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not criticizing any of this. I think human beings are touching and tender and all so flawed, I mean, we're all, we're all very, very flawed, and we really need all the love we can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, connected with uh, the ways in which human beings adapt to their circumstances, find ways to cope, and, and, and ways that kind of transcend that binary of healthy, unhealthy. Yeah. Um, I was drawn to there are connections between blonde and uh, night sleep death the stars that are, that are more, that are, you know, are more expected right? Beauty, femininity, um, exploitation. Um, something that was unexpected uh, is the uh, concept of the evolution, which, which uh, occurs in both books. Um, Norma Jean, um, a little bit later in the book, becomes very fixated on Darwin's origin of the species. And like you mentioned, Jessalyn ends up going to the Galapagos Island, where survival mm -hmm. of the fittest is so intense that you write... Um, 60% of the species dies out of starvation every four to seven years. That is the most extreme end of the survival uh, spectrum. And, absolutely. And I wondered how uh, evolution, you know, factors in, in when you were writing uh, Night Sleep, Death of Stars, um, and, and in general, how, how you think about um, like the human ability to evolve or unfortunately then to be destroyed if not. That's a question I think about all the time, and obviously I was thinking about it at the time of writing Blonde, so that's like 2000, like the year 2000, I think. But Darwinian evolutionary theory is, is, is sort of like the, the, the evolutionary, dr the drama is like the human drama. Mm. That is the drama that's going on in the world that we don't always acknowledge, that things are changing rapidly, sometimes much too quickly for us to adjust to. Sometimes if you're educated and you can see what's coming, you can train yourself and be ready for the changes. Mm. Often that's not the case. People are, people are swept away by, by sudden change. Mm. The, uh, as, as Sartre said, genius isn't a gift. It's a way you invent in desperate circumstances. So the people who are most hungry, most anxious, most maybe unstable, from marginal parts of society, those are the people who are much more able to leap onto the next, you know, the next iceberg or to mm -hmm. climb up the ladder. Uh, Norma Jean learns how to save herself until the very end of her life when everything collapses. She can't mm -hmm. keep on doing it. And in Night, Sleep, Death in the Stars, one of the characters is a research scientist. She's a biologist and she thinks of some of these things also. But all of the children, they learn to adjust. There's mm -hmm. a new environment. There was a, a, maybe there was water here. There was like a swamp land. Now the water's gone. The father has died. And they have to adjust to the next stage of their mm -hmm. own evolution. Mm -hmm. And they all do to some extent. Right. Well, one of them discovers, he learns he really, he's really gay. He's always been attracted to, to boys and men. But as long as his father was alive, he could never acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. So that was very positive. And I th think when there's a sudden change in, in the environment, for some people, it's a liberation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that um, having that large family allowed you to, to absolutely you know, explore all the ways in which um, you know, some, some species are, are you know, granted a new life because the swamp drains and, and others um, have to suddenly figure out what to do with all this mud. Um, so this is a little bit of a reverse of our normal format where usually the author reads and then we have some Q&A, but I did want to give you the option of reading from your latest book um, before we open to, to audience questions um, if you felt like doing so. Okay, I'll just read the very beginning. Mm. The novel is so structured. In fact, Blonde has a structure that was interesting to me because it begins at the end. 
I mean, it, it begins almost at the end of Marilyn Monroe's life. Uh, death comes riding for her on a bicycle. He's a delivery boy. And that precipitates something that happens. And then that precipitates something else. And then we go into the whole story of Blonde, which is like a thousand pages. <laughs> but just because Lillian is a, a novelist, what was interesting to me was that before Marilyn Monroe died, like the day before, mm. she got a mysterious package delivered. And it was a little stuffed, stuffed animal. Mm. And photographs of her the day before she died, she's sitting out on the lawn in her backyard in her house in Bel Air, I think, of Beverly Hills. And she looks very sad. And on the grass is this little stuffed animal. Now that was never explained. And I thought I would use that as the structure for the whole novel. So it's almost like a mystery. Hmm. And it does, it, to me, uh, it's interesting to work with mysteries that have not been solved and to organize a novel around them. And then I, you know, I solve them, the novel is solved. <laughs> Whereas this novel has the opposite structure because it literally begins literally begins with the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is called Prologue. Why? Because he'd seen something he had reason to believe was wrong. And it was within his power, or at any rate, it was his moral obligation to rectify it or to make that attempt. Where? Returning home on the Hennecon Expressway at 3.15 of that day, just beyond the grimy and graffiti-defaced overpass, where in the 1970s a 10-foot chain-link fence had been erected, when high school-aged youths rolled heavy rocks down upon motorists bound for the northern suburbs. From where? A luncheon meeting of the trustees of the Hammond Township Public Library. Driving his vehicle, a new model Toyota Highlander, in the right lane of the three-lane highway at a speed neither above nor below the 55 mile an hour speed, speed limit. This caution in the light of his having consumed a single glass of white wine at the luncheon, though John Earl did not seriously believe that he was driving an influence. Seeing then, just before the exit at Meridian Parkway, which would have had him safely home in his house on Old Farm Road, in which he'd lived so happily with his dear wife for most of his adult life within 20 minutes. A seeing then a ham on police cruiser parked at the side of the road with its red light flashing and another vehicle parked close by, two uniformed police officers pulling a young male, dark skinned individual from his car, shouting into his face and slamming him against the hood of his car slowing his vehicle to get a better look and shocked at what he seemed to be seeing, braking, daring to stop, just be on the police cruiser. Aaron O. McCallum climbed out of his vehicle to approach the officers who were figuring their manhandling of the dark-skinned young man, though it was clear to John Earl that the young man was not resisting them, unless you called trying to shield his face and head from their blows, resisting boldly calling out, stop, officers, what are you doing? Grazing, seeming, fearless, summoning something of his old mayoral authority. He had once been mayor of the city. His old authority in this new century, in this uncharted place, uncharted place, scrubby inner city Hammond in which a stricter and harsher police presence prevailed little known even to white citizens as knowledgeable as John Earl McLaren. And there followed then an excited exchange with John Earl would not recall afterward, as he would but vaguely recall that the dark-skinned man was of slender build, very frightened, not an African-American, but seemingly a young Indian in a suit, white shirt torn and blood splattered, wire rimmed glasses knocked down his face. So it, this precipitates the, uh, the novel, a man of, of middle aged who had once had some authority, he would have been mayor of the city, driving along and seeing what seems like police brutality, just getting out of his car and thinking that he's got this authority to stop these police officers. 
not realizing that it's a different century and it's been 25 years since he's had this authority. So that was the beginning of the, the tragedy of the now. Yeah. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, I think at this point now, um, we can open up to audience questions and make sure that people have a chance to, to get their answers. Yeah, we have a couple questions and people can feel free time permitting to ask more if they have them to ask. But um, the first question is, um, I love your novels because although they are all in the same signature style, some are markedly darker than others. Do you view your works like an artist who moves between realist or impressionist or abstract style? That's a very interesting question. My ideal way of writing would be to, to move back and forth between the kind of Gothic interior phantasmagoria that we experience in our dreams and strict realism. So strict social realism has its own poetic qualities, but the other, you know, descending into the unconscious or writing a postmodernist Gothic experimental novel, much more playful and um, original and demanding, I think. A traditional novel has its own challenges. Now, Night Sleep, Death to Stars is a very traditional novel. It's strict social realism. There's nothing in that novel that's not realistic that may not have just happened, as it turned out. The death of George Floyd just a couple of weeks ago, it's very much, um, you know, adumbrated in this novel. And that's the tragedy of living, I guess, in America, where if you write about something that seems tragic and exaggerated and really, you know, very dramatic, it may turn out to be something that just happens the very day that your novel comes out. There's a question. Um, Joyce, uh, speaking of sort of contemporary things that uh, interpolate fictions, um, has the pandemic affected the plots of any of the stories or novels that you are currently writing? Well, that's also a good question. I think that we have two situations in the United States. One of them is a health issue, which is real in the most existential sense of the word. The other is more amorphous and elusive. That's a political climate of extraordinary toxicity that we haven't had before. Even I think during the years of Joseph McCarthy, we haven't had such a divided America. Well, maybe during the Vietnam War years, there was a lot of anti-Vietnam War sentiment. The generations were fighting in the 1960s. It was generational. It wasn't so much, it wasn't so much class or ideological, I think. Anyway, so we have two situations. One is the virus and the fear of our personal extinction which some people confront very openly and others are in a state of denial about because it's so hard to it's so hard to acknowledge our impossible extinction. And then the other is political and uh, how that happened is just tragic. It just, it just, it happened. So my students at Princeton and at Rutgers where I'm teach, was teaching, my students are these, these young people in their 20s or 19 or even 18 years old, living through an unprecedented era in American history, what they will make of it will be very profound and very interesting. It will change their whole lives. So people who are writing now haven't had time to absorb or assimilate these, these things because it's like after 9-11, some novels were written soon after 9-11, but most people didn't, couldn't write about 9-11 for years afterward. It was too much like an explosion. But that's a good question. And then if people have um, other questions, they can um, 
ask them in the chat, but I think we're actually wrapping up. So I'm just going to ask kind of the standard uh, bookseller question. Um, and Joyce, you mentioned before we went live that you just finished uh, War and Peace. And so my question is for both of you, which is what you're reading right now. Um, sometimes this is a, the, the past couple months have been a time where people find themselves reading more. I think the past couple of weeks have found people not able to read or um, drastically and necessarily read, shifting their reading. Um, but I'm I'm wondering uh, what's on your what's on your plate. Oh, a classic. After reading, after reading Tolstoy's War and Peace, I had to go to Dostoevsky. There you go. <laughs> is there is there is there a pile, or are you, how do you make your way through a reading list? Well, because of the the Tolstoy reading, which is very deeply immersive, I wanted to go back to Do Dostoevsky. The Idiot is the only novel that I've only read once. Most of mm. the other novels I've taught. So I couldn't read Crime and Punishment again. I've taught it many times. The Idiot is surprising, and there are things I don't remember. I haven't read it like in 30 years. Wow, that's great. Lillian, I know you just read these two <laughs> wonderful novels by Joyce Carol Oates, but uh, what's, on the, what's on the list? So um, before I started reading Joyce, I was in the middle of uh, rereading The Secret History, Donna Tartt's book. Oh, that's um, wonderful. So great. Um, and we were talking um, before the event started about the kinds of books that uh, are maybe easier to read right now, which is the sort of longer ones that are also kind of page flippers, uh, which Night Sleep, Death of the Stars absolutely is. But I think it's also nice to just read about um, stylishly awful people. Um, and I think that The Secret History is chock full of, of those kinds of characters, um, uh, just very effectively hor horrifying. Um, so I'm excited to get started uh, back because it's right at the point where they're about to do the kind of unspeakable act uh, within their group. And I'm excited to see how that plays out. Well, that's great. Well, uh, you can certainly find quite sure you can find an edition of The Idiot um, <laughs> on Literati's website. Um, and certainly you can find Donna Tart there as well. I think some of those might be available even for curbside pickup. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm doing my duty there. Uh, and you can also, of course, buy Night Sleep, Death and Stars uh, and the 20th anniversary edition of Blonde at literatibookstore.com. And if you're watching or recording on YouTube, you can buy them right down in the description. Um, Joyce Carol Oates, Lily and Lee, thank you so much for such a really wonderful um, conversation about these books. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us uh, virtually, uh, weaving people together who are tuning in throughout the country. We, we appreciate it greatly. That's definitely my pleasure. Um, getting to pick Joyce's brain for almost a full hour uh, was a chance I never got back in college. So making up for lost time. Thank you, guys. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.